You know, one of the things that I think is the hallmark of our cancer center and of delivering uh, great and outstanding patient care is multidisciplinary management. And uh, so it gives me uh, great pleasure to introduce our surgical oncology panelists today to talk about uh, all the great advances in surgical oncology. So um, if I could invite our panel up. Uh, first, let me introduce Dr. Richard Alexander, Chief Surgical Officer and Chief of Surgical Oncology for the Cancer Institute, and also for the system, Director of Surgical Oncology, who will be our moderator. So come on up, Rich. And then our panelists, Dr. Sabruto Paul, Director of Thor Thoracic Surgical Services at uh, St. Barnabas Medical Center, Dr. Moral Grandi, who's a surgical oncologist at uh, CINJ and Somerset. Michelle Blackwood, our uh, chief uh, for the section of breast surgery at the Rutgers Cancer Institute and medical director, Northern Regional Director of Breast Services at RWJBH. And I wanna thank uh, Michelle for all the work she's been putting in on our clinical trials lately. And uh, Dr. Russell Langan, chief of surgical oncology and hepato Oh, hepatopancreaticobiliary surgery, okay, say that three times quickly, at St. Barnabas Medical Center. So uh, thank you all for coming today and for um, sharing your thoughts on uh, latest advances in, in surgical oncology. Rich? Thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to start just um, first thanking all of you for participating today. Um, we have a fairly high altitude kind of overview of the world of, of surgical oncology. And just to explain to the non-surgeons in the group, um, cancer surgical services are all provided by different specialists. Uh, there might be 11 or 12 different specialties that cover the spectrum of services for patients with cancer. Um, at the Cancer Institute, we have administrative responsibility for about six specialties and then four or five other specialties, such as colorectal, thoracic, head and neck, neurosurgery, and uh, orthopedic oncology are shared administratively between our partners at our medical schools in Newark and uh, in New Brunswick. And then on top of that, there's a second tier of kind of organizational activity. We have specialty-specific leaders that are distributed across our system that all coordinate uh, surgical services uh, amongst various specialties. Um, as an example, um, I think I saw Solly Baridi and uh, Anderson Alloy here from Newark who are head and neck uh, specialists who help us coordinate services there. Uh, up in Newark, we also have Mark Einstein and Livingston, we've got uh, uh, Russell Langen, um, and so uh, in thoracic with Paul, uh, Sabroto Paul and Michelle with, uh, with Breast, coordinating thoracic services with other leaders across the system. So it's a kind of a multi-tiered organizational uh, um, kind of an org chart. But I will say one thing that we all share is that we are all working very hard to establish ourselves as the resource that people turn to when they have a need for specialized surgical services. We all share that goal. And we're all working very hard, engaging ourselves with providers across the region, uh, making ourselves accessible to our patients so that people, when they have a diagnosis of cancer and are in need of surgical services, will think about us as the people they want to come to. Steve Labuti has always said, cancer care does not travel well. And I think that is particularly relevant for patients who are undergoing surgical procedures. If they leave the region for that index, uh, point of their care and they come back, it sets up barriers with respect to coordination of care, information, understanding what transpired, and it's always best for people to get uh, their services close to home. Um, and so we're working hard on establishing a portfolio of services for, uh, to meet the needs of the population that we serve. And I would like to just also add that as part of that, because we're making this, we're making this strong appeal to the region to look to us as the preferred provider, we now have to deliver 
on that promise. And, and very importantly, we've now hired Henry Pitt, I'd like to just point out, as our chief quality officer, who is really putting in place processes and policies that will allow us to ensure that patients who come to us for their surgical services are getting the absolute best care with the best possible outcomes. So I'm very excited about this. Uh, we, are, we are growing programmatically. We're growing physically. We've got a beautiful uh, new cancer hospital going up right across Somerset Street, uh, with, with, which is going to have a whole floor of state-of-the-art uh, uh, ORs uh, ready in four years. So it's a really exciting time to be here. Now, I'm going to ask my panelists to kind of address uh, all of you today from, the, from where they are so that we can keep this kind of a dynamic and interactive session. Point, uh, I think we have no relevant financial disclosures, and I'll put that up there. I just want to highlight a couple of things around surgical oncology that we're going to focus on today. There are really three areas that I think have really defined the big advances in surgical oncology over the last 50 years. Traditionally, the role of the surgical oncologist has been to perform an operation around the primary tumor uh, that was adequate to control it locally and get tissue to stage that patient for additional prognostic information and for treatment planning. You know, we've gone through a lot of uh, clinical research over the last 50 years defining optimally how those operations should be conducted. And we've seen evolution in, in breast cancer and in every other type of, uh, of, of specialty around where that optimal operation around the primary is. And I think one of the big advances we've made is in instrumentation, which now allows patients to undergo their operative procedure minimally invasively, get back to a good quality of life much more quickly. The other two areas which are very important are in the use of surgery to prevent cancer. It creates an incredible kind of a risk-benefit assessment that's unique in that you're taking a patient who's in perfectly good health, but based on uh, a germline mutation, now has to have a conversation with a provider around undergoing an invasive procedure that can be sometimes uh, life-altering to prevent a, an invasive cancer from developing uh, in the future. And then lastly, an area that I'm particularly interested in, which is the use, the increasing use of surgery to treat metastatic cancer. And that's created, uh, I think, a great opportunity for us based on understanding of tumor biology and working with our radiation and, and medical oncology colleagues to be able to treat micrometastatic disease more effectively that we've now become uh, increasingly aware that patients with metastatic cancer can oftentimes be uh, uh, clinically benefited from uh, surgical therapies. I'm going to start by asking um, Dr. Russ Langen to talk a little bit about pancreatic cysts. This is a very, very kind of exemplar area where risk reduction surgery has to, is, is important uh, in that we know that there are certain types of uh, lesions in the pancreas that can degenerate into cancer, but pancreatic cancer it has certain risks to it. So it's a very, very uh, uh, sophisticated topic that requires a lot of considerations on multiple levels. Russ? Yes, good morning, and, and thank you so much for um, having us and, and having me here. I'll take a few minutes and address uh, risk uh, of pancreatic cancer. Generally speaking, within our healthcare system, from our system CEO down, uh, we have made great efforts um, to focus on preventative medicine, preventative care, um, and we find that pancreatic cysts fit perfectly uh, within that concept. Similar to pulmonary lung nodules, of which we also have preventative uh, programs. Pancreatic cysts are unique uh, in the body in that um, certain pancreatic cysts can be precancerous, meaning they increase the risk for the development of pancreatic cancer. Certain pancreatic cysts represent a risk not only of the cyst, but of the entire pancreas, and they require uh, surveillance and appropriate surveillance and multidisciplinary uh, surveillance. Why focus on pancreatic cysts? Well, if you look to the screen, pancreatic cancer represents uh, only um, approximately 3% of newly diagnosed cancers in the United States. However, is the third to fourth leading cause of cancer-related death. Um, and if you look at the, the line uh, you know, graph, that is um, uh, mean-adjusted death rates in males from 1930 to 2018 for a number of different disease sites. And there are a lot of historical factors within this that we brought up in our own group as it relates to lung and gastric um, within um, industrialization of the country and, and the, our world wars. But if you, if you look and see, many malignancies have had decreasing 
death rates over time. On the bottom of that is a light blue line, and that is pancreas, and it has just remained uh, stable. We clearly all know that for uh, all comers, um, the um, five-year survival for a long time was 4%. We are now up to 10% on modern literature, um, but wow, 10%, we still have a long way to go. Mucinous pancreatic cysts, and in particular, uh, IPMN, introductal papillary mucinous um, neoplasm, those are the most identifiable precursor to pancreatic cancer. So as a um, pancreatic society, we should be focusing on them. And pancreatic centers of excellence uh, do. One concern is that there are a number of patients that uh, do get lost uh, within the community. There are a number of practitioners that really are trying to do right by these patients. Um, but there are international and national guidelines that should be followed. Um, and many times, patients are just not within those guidelines. Next slide. Um, so there are a number of different pancreatic cysts. Some are pre-malignant and some are benign. The pre-malignant cysts are the mucinous cysts. So IPMN or mucinous cystic neoplasia, those are precancerous. It really takes a pancreatic expert, either in the field of GI or pancreatic surgery, or even a pancreatic multidisciplinary team to sort out the risk. Pancreatic cysts are all about weighing risk because, next slide you need to weigh the risk of an operation against the risk of a patient developing a pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic surgery, even if done at high volume centers across the country, um, still um, have published mortality rates upwards of uh, two to four percent. So why would you ever offer a pancreatic surgery to a patient if the mortality rate is two to four percent, if the risk of the cyst is less than that? So these patients really require team approaches, and we have that. One a beautiful thing that has come out of the pandemic um, are the virtual conferences. We are now linking our campuses for a weekly pancreatic conference, and, and half of that pancreatic conference uh, are pancreatic cyst patients. And, and we have practitioners that uh, will present patients from Community Medical Center, Monmouth Medical Center, our campuses in the north, and, and our multidisciplinary team reviews that patient individually. This is a, 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 a snapshot of one particular paper um, that was published by Dr. Peter Allen um, in 2018. And this uh, combined three major institutions in the country, Johns Hopkins, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and the MGH, and they came up with 1,028 patients that had a pancreatic cyst resected. And if you filter down um, to look at the pathology, in those that in those that were resected to prevent pancreatic cancer, 70% had very low risk disease within the specimen. Meaning that even at our major centers in the country, we still cannot grasp the true risk of a pancreatic cyst. So what that tells me is that you need a team for this. You need multiple minds coming together to see which patient to offer surgery. This paper also had a nomogram that was in it to risk stratify patients. We use that nomogram in our clinics, but it's very important to keep in mind that if someone has a pancreatic cyst, they have risk, but it might just require surveillance. Next slide. Even after surgery, patients can recur either with high risk cyst or cancer. And, and um, one box on that slide found that after five years, 17% of patients recurred with high-risk disease. These patients require lifelong surveillance. Here within our RWJ Barnabas Health, we do have a formal pancreatic cyst surveillance program. Um, it is a true multidisciplinary program, and we are very proud to have uh, put that together. Thank you, Russ. That was terrific. So, you know, there are many, many different organs in the body for which uh, risk reduction surgery is something that we discuss across a variety of specialties. And pancreas cancer is really, uh, I think, a representative area where that risk benefit discussion is so paramount. Uh, and, and, and oftentimes these approaches are highly individualized based upon patient wishes and, uh, and other factors. One of the other major advances that we have made has been in instrumentation. I use that word deliberately because we're, I'm really talking about our robots, but it's minimally invasive procedures, and this touches every specialty in surgery. So I've asked Dr. Uh, Paul to talk a little bit about robotics and, that, and, and its influence on uh, the management of uh, cancer patients undergoing surgery. 
Thank you very much, Rich, um, and thank you for having me. So um, I wanted to kind of give you a talk about what is the present day and what maybe the future be. As you kind of hear me, you'll listen, you'll listen to like kind of the tech side, geek side of me. Uh, I think part of the reason I became a surgeon is I like to play with instruments, and now the, with uh, advances in technology and particularly software, we are going to be doing things that you would only dream about or see in a movie in it that, that was like done in the 70s. So um, there are obviously robots among us. You know, you've got a Tesla car, you can put it in, a, I guess there's a, I don't have a Tesla, but I guess there's a sicko mode, an autopilot mode, all sorts of things that you can do. Uh, the car drives itself. Um, if you have, if you're ever in an airplane and we can travel now and you're in a 787, it has autopilot. It can take off and it can land by itself. Amazon in 2014 actually brought a uh, company to basically robotically take uh, packages in a warehouse and ship it to, an, uh, to an, another part of the warehouse without having anything. So there is definitely more and more uh, automation, robotics. You know, it's a, kind of like a Jetsons episode uh, from, you know, when I was growing up in the 80s. Um, you see all these things and you thought that this would never happen. Would it be ever possible to have like a little phone in your hand and talk to somebody like halfway around the world? If you, someone told you that in the 70s or 80s, well, actually my dad, I told my dad, that might happen one day. He told me, we're done innovating. It's done, we're just done. <laughs> uh, I'm like, okay, dad. Um, I think you know, that kind of explained his mentality. Can you hit the next slide, please? This is what I'm hoping for, that I can have like a ro surgical robot, like RTD2, so I won't need residents and I can operate from my home. But uh, <laughs> currently, uh, that's not quite possible. But clearly, there is an interest in minimally invasive surgery. The goal is um, to make the surgery so simple, minimally invasively, that anybody can do it. Um, one of the problems you saw, that we saw when we were developing video-assisted technology, or our VATS lobectomies, um, you can see that there are a certain group of surgeons who can do it and can do it well and do it consistently and they can do it for it, easy cases, hard cases. But it was hard to teach uh, because you, there's a special skill set involved. And it was similar with, for example, with prostatectomies. You can do a laparoscopic prostatectomy. There was some guy who, when I was training uh, who was at MGH who did you know, uh, laparoscopic prostatectomies. It took him like six hours, but he could do them. Um, but it was hard to teach anybody to do it, and it's very difficult to get it out and be widespread in the community. Uh, one of my things is that it's great if one person can do this amazing surgery or amazing performance, but nobody else can. That doesn't really benefit society, uh, in, any, in my mind. It benefits that person. He looks great. He looks great at meetings, presenting something that you know, only he can do. So you have to make, it, make whatever technology out there teachable, so everybody can do it and every patient can benefit. And I think that's where robotics comes in. It mimics open surgery in such a way with the uh, wristed instrumentation that it looks like, you know, it's like, it's kind of like playing a video game, but it's actually doing normal surgery. It's actually more akin to open surgery than it is to minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery, although it's in, within that same uh, ballpark. Obviously, there was Intuitive Surgical and uh, the Da Vinci Robot, which was, first came out, was actually uh, came out of a DARPA program for defense. The idea was that the military was going to deploy these robots in the battlefield, and you would have skilled surgeons you know, at home doing surgery on them. It didn't quite work out that way, but uh, it has provided us a great tool um, to do minimally invas uh, invasive surgery. Initially, it was for uh, prostatectomies, and it's come kind of advanced and onward to uh, doing hysterectomies, and now we routinely do lung surgeries, lobectomies, esophagectomies, and other you know parts of the our body, including uh, colectomies, with with this uh, with these tools. Um, because of its popularity and its increasing stock price, uh, other companies have gone into this. Uh, Johnson and Johnson's coming out with a robot. Medtronic's coming out with a robot. There's a robot from Versius, and I think. Uh, what's going to be useful is like currently this is like I would say generation one. Um, it is, it is you know using kind of crude instrumentation to do it. It's obviously much more advanced than you would thought in the 70s, 80s, or 90s, but still crude. What the revolution is going to be is actually taking the data, the data that Dr. Hoxter talked about from our EHRs, from our uh, imaging, and superimposing them onto the you know, screen so you can actually see the real-time anatomy and the robot or the visualization is actually giving you data of 
what the critical structures are as you are progressing through surgery. You know, I think uh, recently uh, Mark Zuckerberg renamed Facebook to Meta uh, and talk about the metaverse. And I was thinking, what the hell is this? I'm like, is this some sort of gimmick? Um, but then I read something that I thought was kind of interesting. People are trying to come up with a virtual shopping experience. You put on a headset and you like, you know, you're walking through sacks and buying stuff. Um, so I can actually foresee, in, because they have some uh, modules of this, where you can be, you know, have a headset on and doing your surgery before you actually did the surgery. And, and that way, you know, you are not doing a four-hour procedure because you're doing it real time. You've done it already. You've practiced it. And it's done in two hours, and you know what all the pitfalls are. So I think that is where we're headed. And I think that's what's exciting. You know, uh, I wish I were 10 years younger because then I think could see the whole thing of it, but I might be retired by, that, by the time that it happens. Well, we'll see. Uh, can you have the next slide? So that's just surgery. In pulmonology, uh, Intuitive Surgical as well as J&J &J have come out with uh, robotic bronchoscopes. We actually have one of these at Barnabas. The pulmonologists are playing around with it. They don't know this, but I told them, hey, well, yeah, you guys do it. Just work out the kinks, and I'll, we'll come back uh, to see what we can do with it in, in, uh, in thoracic surgery. But other, uh, you know, other modalities are coming out. There's going to be, there's a robotic catheterization equipment coming out. Essentially, you make the, uh, the arterial puncture, and the robot will go to your, wherever your coronaries are, and stick a stent in there. Um, that's in development. There's other versions of this for GI, and I think it's going to allow us to do a lot of different things that, you know, are incredibly difficult. Like, for example, in thoracic surgery for benign disease, there's a procedure called POEM, a peral endoscopic myotomy. Uh, it's a treatment for achalasia where the muscle of the lower esophageal sphincter is very thickened. Surgically, it's a one-hour procedure for us to just kind of robotically cut that thing. But some people don't want that. They want to have it done endoscopically through a scope or through, the, uh, through an endoscope. That procedure itself is difficult. Very few GI doctors can do. There, there is coming a version of a gastroscope that you can put in robotically and has little instruments coming out. That would make that procedure into a 15-minute very safe procedure. That, so that instead of having three people in the eastern seaboard who are very skilled at this, you can pretty much have any GI doctor do it. So I think the advantage of robotics is, A, providing, you know, getting patients out of the hospital faster because it's minimally invasive surgery, but the real true advantage is how you can make it more widespread adoption of this technology. So well, thank you. leave it at that. Thank you, Sabar. That's great. I, I, I think just for clarity, we want to make sure that everyone in the room understands that the surgeon is in the room. They're not at home. <laughs> when they're doing these robotic procedures, as of now. As of now. <laughs> the goal is to do it from your you know, bedroom. <laughs> We're covering a number of topics here. We've talked about uh, uh, advances in instrumentation. We've talked about uh, the, 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 the subspecialty in surgery around preventative risk reduction surgery. We're going to transition to talking a little bit about clinical trials and the surgical treatment of metastatic cancer. And I think I'm going to open up our conversation around the surgeon and clinical trials by having Michelle discuss this very, very uh, paradigm-shifting iSpy2 trial, which has now been opened, and that has taken considerable effort, Michelle. I really want to congratulate you on that, but this is now added value to the population that we serve by having this option available, because this is a very innovative study that really can provide clinical benefit to many women with, with breast cancer. So this is a complex slide. I'm going to let you have at it. So I'm going to really avoid this slide because it will really put you guys to sleep, but <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. It's so nice to see people in person again since we've been, uh, it's great to collaborate by Zoom or web meeting or whatever we're doing, but actually seeing everybody back in person after a couple of years is really great. A couple things to know is I'm a breast cancer surgeon. I consider myself foremost clinically uh, where I feel the most comfortable. That's how I was trained and that's where I kind of sit. Most surgeons, and we have some great breast surgeons here today, we, we are, you know, very adept at hopefully our craft, but also at identifying the patients and what kind of surgery they can have. There's a lot of options, believe it or not. Some people think that breast surgery is all about one disease, and the people that actually drill down on this are medical oncologists that are here. Um, it's many, many different diseases, and it comes in lots of different varieties. Well, as the reality is, we are seeing a lot more stage two and three disease at diagnosis. And the re we want to know what is the best treatment for these patients prior to surgery. The ISPY2 trial addresses this. 
iSpy2 is being led by the national PI, Laura Esterman, who is a breast cancer surgeon out of San Francisco. She's pretty famous for being a breast cancer surgeon, also singing in the OR. I can tell you this, you don't want me singing in the OR, and I don't do this. But I did call her when this trial came to our attention. And the reality is we needed to be a part of this. So I collaborated with Laura. Laura spent an entire weekend explaining this trial. It's a neoadjuvant trial for stage two and three breast cancer cases. And it basically starts with the diagnosis of breast cancer, an entire team approach, including radiology and pathology. And then it morphs into something really exciting. As many of us know, when we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, sometimes we don't see a response. It's very disappointing when we do the surgery and we find that there's still a tremendous amount of cancer left. In fact, it's, it feels kind of defeating. I know for the patients it does as well. So the iSpy2 actually starts with the biopsy and an MRI. Good MRIs of the breast have been a, a, a real lifesaver and changer in our world. We don't get as many surprises in the operating room anymore. Anyway, you give the MRI during treatment and if the patient does not respond to treatment after a certain amount of time, and we can actually calculate the volume of disease still left in the breast, then they can be changed to a different arm of the treatment or a different arm of the trial. That's very unusual. As you and I, as most people in here, we've participated in trials, it's usually you have to kind of make your way through the trial, and then maybe after the surgery, maybe add something else. This is game changing. Um, we are now involved with most of the major medical centers and cancer centers throughout the entire United States. And I'm involved in those meetings on Monday nights. Now, the good news for them is it's 3 o'clock meeting because a lot of them are on the West Coast. For me, of course, it's 6 o'clock at night. But that's okay. My kids are gone and out of the house. But the reality is that we need these kind of collaborations because this is going to change everything for our patients. We want stage two and three cancer not to be hopefully cured. We want it to be definitely cured. And by being able to morph through a trial like this with lots of different arms of the trial, I think that we can get to that point. It is an, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do, but I urge anybody here who actually does some, some ideas and does want to open a trial, I've had incredible support from Dr. Hoxter and the people at CINJ. And I can tell you, my, I'm located mostly in Livingston, but because of this new virtual world we have, we've been able to meet regularly, we've been able to change a few things, we've been able to keep this thing on track. It's literally been nine months, but yesterday I found out that we are going to have our opening letter starting next week. So I'm really excited about this. Thank you. Um, Coral Lemeny has been working with me. She's at, NCI, at CINJ, and Coral is a medical oncologist who's been sort of my partner slogging through this, and she opened her, the trial at the CINJ campus here in New Brunswick um, about two months ago. So I urge you, if you have any questions about how to do this, sometimes it's just good old-fashioned footwork, going on the websites, finding out who's in charge of the trial, making a cold call. That's what I did with Laura Esserman. She had no idea who I was at the time, but... Thankfully, now I'm in her mm -hmm. cell phone. Um, so it is worthwhile. I think it's great to collaborate with directors around the country. Um, they give us their pearls, and we're going to hopefully be a part of changing the world of breast cancer and being right on the forefront of that and providing the women and men of New Jersey the best cancer care we possibly can. Thank you. Michelle, thank you very much. We're going to circle back to clinical research um, at the end, I have a, uh, I'm going to stop here because I did want to ask Meryl Grandi to uh, talk about the role of surgery in the treatment of metastatic cancer. And there's probably no better example uh, of how surgery can benefit patients with metastatic cancer than liver metastases. And so this is, uh, this is Meryl's area of expertise. And I, I'm going to ask you to take away, Meryl. Thank you. So thank you all for having me today. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to to um, uh, talk a little bit about colorectal liver metastases. So as you all know, colon cancer, the way we treat colon cancer has changed quite a bit over the last two decades. You know, really what's allowed us to be more 
aggressive surgically is the fact that our systemic therapies have really improved the outcomes of patients. And it's not just systemic therapy, but it's also the addition of targeted therapy. And so we're becoming smarter about how we're treating these cancers, looking at circulating tumor DNA and, um, and their specific uh, mutational status to be able to target their cancers more specifically. But again, that's allowed us to be more aggressive from a surgical standpoint because these patients are thankfully living a little bit longer than they were 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. Um, the biggest thing that I've noticed here at CINJ is our volumes really over the last two years have grown substantially. We've nearly doubled our surgical, well, we have doubled our surgical volumes, going from about 40 a year to roughly 100 a year now. And that's um, all liver diseases. You know, the reason we focus on colorectal liver metastases is because that is the number one disease process that we deal with in the liver. Um, part of this has been you know, just retaining things within our system and really functioning as a system up at Barnabas, down at Community Medical Center, and at New Brunswick, um, also Somerset and Monmouth. And so we're really starting to, to keep things within our system, but it's also the education factor of, um, that comes into play. So really going out and speaking um, out in the community and educating um, not only patients, but also medical oncologists about the fact that there are oftentimes things we can do to um, treat these patients surgically and, and uh, hopefully cure them of their disease. So um, just to give a little bit of statistical background, roughly 20% um, of patients who have colorectal um, liver metastases will be cured of their disease with, uh, with full systemic therapy and surgical intervention. Um, with surgical intervention, roughly 50% of these patients that are diagnosed will be alive at five years. And so we really are extending the life of, life of these patients, if not curing them. Just to give an idea of what we're doing, uh, the patient, um, the, the films on the top, so the black and white films, are all um, CT scans that are of the same patient. And he had extensive disease when he was diagnosed roughly in March of, 2000, um, March of 2019 and went on to get systemic therapy, went on to undergo a two-stage procedure, not only resecting his liver metastases, but also clearing his primary disease, and was about disease-free for roughly about a year and a half before he recurred. Um, and he's recurred not in the liver, but in the periaortic lymph node. So, you know, it is a, uh, a long um, run, but, but the patient, I, I do think that we've extended his life with this surgical intervention. Um, the picture to the bottom right is a picture of someone who's undergoing a right hepatectomy for, uh, I guess, sorry, your bottom left is uh, oh, no, a patient sorry. who's I, undergoing I, a, um, a, a right hepatectomy for colorectal liver metastases. We can often stage these, and so um, that's, that's also uh, looking at the bottom right picture. That's someone that I just operated on Thursday that underwent a partial hepatectomy um, three partial hepatectomies for colorectal liver metastases. So we're actually advancing this skill set to, um, to incorporate robotic surgery, which is hugely beneficial to our patients. You know, most of them end up with an upper midline and a right subcostal cutting through their uh, right rectus sheath, which can be very painful. And their um, post-op, of course, can be, you know, anywhere from three to five days in the hospital. But uh, this patient's hopefully going to go home today who's two days out from surgery and is about 78 years old. So I think adding the addition of, um, of robotic surgery is really um, can be very beneficial to our patients in the correctly selected patient population is the other thing to add. Um, so next slide, please. So the other thing that we have brought to New Brunswick within the last year is microwave ablation with surgical navigation. So microwave ablation is a technology that we use in the operating room to help clear a patient's liver disease. So at times, um, I recently had a patient who had pretty significant disease in the left side of the liver as well as the left, but using a combination of microwave ablation plus surgical resection, we were able to clear one side of his, his disease and we'll come back at a second stage to, um, to resect the right lobe of the liver. But the benefit of microwave ablation is instead of having to take out a large um, uh, segment of liver in order to resect a colorectal liver metastasis, you can often just burn that spot if it's of the appropriate size. And um, that's where microablation is helpful. Now, this requires quite a bit of technical expertise with your ultrasound to be able to make sure you're getting it right in the middle of the spot. And so that way you're really getting a good burn and, and, and truly treating that disease. What we have brought to New Brunswick in the last year is this surgical navigation. So it allows the probe of the ultrasound to be synced with the probe of the, of the microwave ablation. And so that way it's giving you a target. As you can see in the picture on the right, 
the ultrasound is being used and there's a target in two different dimensions as to how your burn is gonna be around that lesion. So I just recently, again, about two weeks ago, operated on a patient where we did several microwave ablations and the resident did those ablations because it's, it's an amazing technology where you can actually tr you know, teach the residents and the fellows how to do this, where before it really relied upon surgeon expertise, and so oftentimes I was the one doing the ablation. So this is fantastic, not only from a training standpoint, but really from a patient standpoint. It saved probably about two hours in the operating room, so the patient was off the operating room table two hours sooner than they would have been with about five different ablations. So um, it's been a great technology. I think we've all used it at some point, and uh, we look forward to being able to treat patients um, more patients with this technology in an expedited fashion. And the last thing I wanted to mention is hepatic arterial infusion pump. So we did have a pump program here in New Brunswick that um, when the hurricanes hit in Puerto Rico, unfortunately one of the parts that was processed there was severely affected in the terms of manufacturing, so it came off the market. It has recently gone uh, back on the market as an FDA-approved um, means of treating uh, colorectal liver metastases. The idea is uh, feeding a catheter directly into the gastroduodenal artery, which then uh, provides flow directly into the hepatic artery. As we know, colorectal liver metastases, as well as most liver tumors, are fed by the arterial supply of the liver, and thus by being, by having this catheter directly into an artery that then feeds the hepatic artery, you're essentially um, able to deliver chemotherapies directly into the liver, and it's clear predominantly through the liver, so it also mitigates your uh, systemic um, effects. The concept behind the hepatic arterial infusion pump was really um, initially uh, used to take patients from unresectable um, colorectal liver metastases to a resectable state, and, and uh, particularly um, several institutions have had great success with that, but now it's actually being used in clinical trials to look at patients that would benefit from it on an adjuvant standpoint, and so people who are high risk for a recurrence. There's actually a trial in the Netherlands looking at people who have one colorectal liver metastasis and if this helps them from uh, recurring, so even the low risk, lower risk patients. So there's a lot of things that are being done with the hepatic arterial infusion pump across the world, and um, we're looking to implement that, both Dr. Langen and I kind of a, across both, uh, both campuses and try to bring that back to our institution to be able to treat patients even uh, further for colorectal liver metastases. Thank you, Meryl. We're gonna wind up here um, with one last um, example of how surgeons are uh, treating metastatic cancer. This is a, these are two patients, cross-sectional images and uh, CT scans showing a diffuse malignant process in the in the abdomen, this, these are both patients with either an appendiceal cancer in the, the top panel or the bottom panel is a colorectal cancer patient. You can see on the lower panel the omental mass there, which is uh, metastatic disease in the peritoneum. And there has been now for the last 20 years an interest in the use of cytoreduction with heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. And I will be the first to admit, having been involved with this for many years, it's still a controversial area in, 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 in across many different diseases. But it is. Uh, something that is being evaluated uh, in clinical trials uh, around the world. Uh, one of the um, large unanswered questions really relates to what's the best and uh, uh, sequence and duration of chemotherapy that should be administered uh, for patients undergoing these site reduction procedures. And I really want to thank you, Howard, for your efforts in helping us. Uh, uh, oh, this is just an example of what the site reduction looks like. It just shows you the that's a picture of the right upper quadrant there, the peritoneum overlying the, the liver and the, the way that you can strip that peritoneum away, which is in the top upper panel there. On the other side, you can see the tumors coming out cleanly, and then the heated intraperitoneal perfusion at the bottom there. But after surgery, we really don't know. We know these patients are at very high risk for recurrence. We don't know if we need to treat them more with chemo, if that's going to change the natural history of the, of, the, uh, of the disease. So we now have opened the Pericles study, and I was just mentioning that I, I, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to Howard Hoxter for really kind of pushing this forward and getting it to completion. We had a fellow last year, um, I, Dr. Lee, right? Sharon Lee. Yeah, I don't know if she's in the room, but she also was instrumental and put a lot of footwork into getting this going. But what we're doing now is we're looking at CT DNA, circulating tumor DNA, after site reduction to inform us as to whether or not this patient can safely undergo observation or whether or not we should be recommending additional chemotherapy. So this is just the the flow chart here showing that we get CTDNA before surgery, after surgery, and then at regular intervals and follow-up, 
uh, with a recommendation that when CTA is negative, we observe, and when it's positive, that we would then go on and continue to treat with systemic chemotherapy. I think we've run out of time. I did want to mention one other trial uh, that Russ is uh, spearheading, which is an adjuvant study in pancreas cancer. It's in a multidisciplinary uh, national study, right, Russ? Yes, it's an alliance trial um, looking at resectable pancreatic cancers. As you all know, that is another controversial area. Traditionally, those patients were treated with surgery and adjuvant therapy. More recently, institutions across the country have been giving neoadjuvant therapy to that population. It's never truly been studied. So we are now participating in the Alliance trial. Patients with resectable pancreatic cancer will be randomized to either upfront surgery followed by adjuvant systemic therapy or perioperative therapy with neoadjuvant systemic surgery and then adjuvant systemic. Uh, the trial uh, will be open at St. Barnabas Medical Center, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Jersey City Medical Center, and potentially down the road, Monmouth Medical Center. Um, so uh, we're, we're very excited to participate in this um, uh, multi-center uh, national trial to hopefully answer this question and standardize care for this patient population. One other small uh, comment. Um, I would like everyone in the room to know that for um, the state of New Jersey, we are the highest volume pancreatic surgery group, and we are a group. We have eight surgeons in our group. We do pancreatic surgery uh, in many campuses uh, within the system. St. Barnabas Medical Center, Jersey City Medical Center, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, Monmouth Medical Center, and Community Medical Center. We have pancreatic surgeons, and we function as a group. Uh, we're very proud of that. As you know, outcomes are tied to volume, um, and um, I just had to say that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you.